Okay, can everybody hear me? Go ahead and type yes in the chat if you can. Awesome. We'll get started. Welcome back to Zeg Talk 101 webinar series. My name is Anna Sanford and I'm the operations coordinator for parent and family relations. I'll be hosting the Q&A portion of this webinar later on. Before we begin, I wanted to let everybody know that closed captioning is available for today's webinar. There should be a button at the bottom of your Zoom window that you can click on to enable captions if you'd like. Today, I'm joined by the leadership team of Center for Student Academic Success, Director Deb Stevenson, Director Jilly Cully, Associate Director Jason Vernado, and Associate Director Bryce Thomas. And then following that, we'll see the team from the Office of Health Promotion. This is Health Educator Catherine Noble, Health Educator Sydney Chifetz, and Lead Investigator Christina Thomas. We'll begin with the Center for Student Academic Success, followed by the Office of Health Promotion. There'll be a combined Q&A for both of our presenters following the presentation by the Office of Health Promotion. If you have any questions during the webinar, go ahead and type them in the chat below. If you'd like to re-watch the webinar, we'll post a link on our Parent and Family Facebook page to the YouTube video. Okie dokie, so I am gonna go ahead and turn my audio and screen off and we can get started with the presentation by the Center for Student Academic Success. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Great to see so many parents on the call today. Um, as Anna said, I've got Jason and Jill and uh, Bryce here with me from the Center for Student Academic Success. And Jill, I think we've got we've got a few slides. I think we're going to throw up for you, um, family. Here we go. Great, thanks, Jill. <clears throat> And Anna, do I understand you're going to be monitoring our chat for questions? Yes, I will be monitoring the chat. Okay, great. Well, good. Welcome again. Um, I'm Debbie Stevenson. I direct the Center for Student Academic Success at Gonzaga. Uh, we're a, a fairly new center on campus. We're, well, new, um, I guess, compared to the, the age of the institution. We're about five years old. Um, we're an organization that includes three pretty active offices, a writing center and an academic testing center. Jill, you want to flip to that next screen? I guess I, could, I guess I could be sharing it. Technology, right? Now it's working. There we go. So uh, we're an all-inclusive. We like to consider ourselves a one-stop shop academic resource center. Um, as I said, three offices, um, a writing center and an academic testing center are all part of our physical space in Foley Library. We uh, live and work, well, not currently because we're all at home. Uh, we hope to be back to campus very soon, but we, um, uh, we are spread across two floors in Foley Library in two separate wings. Um, but we certainly have a presence there. The three offices are the Academic Advising and Assistance Office. That's the unit that Jill runs. The Disability Access Office, Jason's in charge of that office. And our Learning Strategies Management Office. And Bryce Thomas is going to talk to you about what, what uh, uh, he oversees in terms of learning strategies at Gonzaga. Our mission is to um, uh, help develop students to become independent and active learners. Um, and as, as you see here on the screen, um, we want students to be in control of their own journeys to success. Um, and we are here to provide those layers of support and encouragement and meet students where they are. I wanna turn it over to you, Jill, and let you talk about uh, what you all have been doing this summer in the advising office and what, uh, how you'll be engaging students in the fall. Um, so as Deb said, my name is Jill Cully. I'm the Associate Director of the Academic Advising and Assistance Office at Gonzaga. 
We, uh, we're a, a staff of professional advisors. Uh, we refer to ourselves as AAA. So if you hear me see AAA in the um, presentation, that's academic advising and assistance. We help students in a variety of ways, including advising and course enrollment, academic planning, policy clarification and advocacy, academic standing and recovery, as well as academic management and faculty notifications for students. <clears throat> Advisors in our office carry both primary and supplemental advising responsibilities. We partner with the psychology department to provide consistent advising in the freshman and sophomore year for their new majors. In junior year, we help these students transition to faculty in the psychology department for further advising while remaining on as a secondary advisor for the students. AAA also advises students who are between majors or those needing additional major and career discernment support. Supplemental advising consists of all other advising done on a temporary short-term basis by the professional staff in our office. We assist students with academic policies, academic planning, course enrollment assistance, and help students manage their academics in terms of challenge. Any student at the university can see a AAA advisor at any time. Your new students know us best right now as we're also responsible for the creation of their first semester schedules. Students were placed in courses based on their academic interests and history coming into Gonzaga. Advisors work closely with department chairs and faculty to ensure students are enrolled in the right courses and on track to earning a Gonzaga degree. Students will be official, our schedules will be official and final later this month, at which point students may request changes to their schedules. All schedule changes will be virtual this year. Students will be able to connect with us by Zoom, phone, or email. <clears throat> a very small percentage of Gonzaga students may find themselves on academic probation should their term or cumulative GPA fall below 2.0 at the end of any fall or spring semester. A committee of faculty will meet to review individual student cases and circumstances and make recommendations for their future terms at Gonzaga. Most often, students will work with a professional advisor in our office. It's time for students to consider their academic history what actions led them to this critical point in their time as a GU student and empowers them to make decisions and choices moving forward to recovery from probation. In addition to advising and academic recovery, we also partner with the Center for Cure Personalis through REFER. REFER is an online form that anyone, including parents, can fill out when they're concerned or worried about a student, whether that's academic or social emotional. Upon receipt of referrals, staff in AAA and CCP collaborate to reach out and engage with the student to connect them to an on-campus and sometimes off-campus resource. Last year, we assisted nearly 700 students through this combined effort. That includes a brief description of what academic advising and assistance provides students. Next up is my colleague, Jason Barnado, the Associate Director from Disability Access. Thanks, Jill. Um, so as Jill said, I'm uh, Jason, Associate Director of Disability Access. Um, my office establishes accommodations for students with disabilities. Um, a disability is um, either a temporary or a permanent condition. Um, but we, we create accommodations for both of those, but it's defined as any physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life functions. Um, that's the definition from the Americans with Disabilities Act. So uh, we follow Section 504 of the Rehab Act and uh, the, the ADA, of course. Um, <clears throat> so we uh, create uh, accommodations, um, provide auxiliary aids, sometimes uh, assistive technology, and give other types of assistance to students with disabilities. Um, we support faculty and staff in um, implementing accommodations. And um, we, uh, of course, support the students in um, ensuring that they feel empowered to ask for, for their accommodations. We also recognize that uh, disability is an aspect of diversity that is integral to society and our campus. Um, so our students with disabilities, and my cat's meowing, I'm <coughs> sorry, um, our students with disabilities are, are a very important um, aspect of um, life on campus and uh, um, Jesuit education. So um, applying for accommodations is a voluntary self-identifying process that requires, we do require medical documentation um, unless the uh, condition is evident. 
and then um, yeah so our process basically student requests accommodation they provide us with documentation we review that documentation uh, determine if the accommodation that, there, that is requested is appropriate to the condition and the uh, functional limitations listed in the uh, documentation medical documentation and then um, also kind of explore maybe if we think the student might need other accommodations um, to access uh, all facets of, of learning and life at Gonzaga. Um, yeah, so now I'll turn it over to my colleague Bryce uh, to talk about learning strategies. Thank you, Jason. Uh, my name is Bryce and I oversee the area of learning strategies and part of learning strategies is the Academic Test Center. So Academic Test Center works in collaboration with the Disability Access Office just to ensure that students with testing accommodations are able to fully utilize those accommodations. Um, so generally what we're talking about here is class tests, class quizzes, but really any aspect of your students um, time at Gonzaga that has graded components that need some sort of accommodation, um, the test center can help with that. Um, obviously, the faculty at Gonzaga are great in working with students and seeing what their accommodations are. So we always like to have students have that interactive process with their faculty to really determine what's the best way to use that test accommodation. Many times that can happen in the classroom setting, um, but when it can't, we're definitely here to help. Um, we work on a pre-scheduled appointment basis, so it's really a collaboration between students and professors to let us know when the student needs to take the test, what that looks like, um, and we help facilitate that process. The Academic Testing Center offers space and resources for students to take their tests, whether it's just distraction reduced environment, maybe extended time um, or technology needs, scribes, things like that. Again, we really just work closely with the Disability Access Office to make sure whatever the accommodation it is, um, students need to have fulfilled, we're able to do that uh, within our center. And then with all of our offices at Gonzaga, really our staff are just here to help students out. So if it, a student's unsure as to how to set up an exam or how to talk to a professor, um, we're available to help with that process. And then the other area that I oversee is the Learning Strategies Management Office. So really this is our kind of proactive wing that talks about uh, academic skills that students can really master as they come to college. And we do that through a variety of different methods and programs. Um, we have both professional and um, student staff that help facilitate these programs. Our biggest program that we do have is called our Learning Studio, and that's our subject specific peer tutoring. So that's just, you know, if you need help in your math class or with accounting, we have tutors that um, span the scope of all majors and all classes that are available to help with that, um, that kind of assistance. Again, faculty are an amazing resource for students to go to if they have questions in their class or they're not sure about material. Um, but having that pure student perspective about this is how you approach a class or this is really um, how you translate that information your professor is talking about is a valuable resource to students to have that um, be able to talk to, with a peer, um, be able to get assistance on those subjects and really kind of grow their knowledge in those classes. The other side of what we do um, is the broader academic coaching. So right now, this is our professional staff work with students on a one on one basis um, on a variety of um, academic topics. And it's really guided by what the student is looking for. Um, big topics that we see students coming in with are just um, the challenges of time management, and organizing what it's like to be in college. Um, the, the script of college is different. You're not in class very often, and there's a lot of independent time that you have to figure out what you're going to do and how you're going to prepare. So kind of setting some guidelines and um, really helping students determine where they're at and what they need to do to be successful in their courses is a big part of what those staff members do. Um, and then really any academic uh, skill, whether it be note taking, test taking, um, really just seeing what students are um, trying to work on where they're trying to improve their skills and then giving them real active and um, kind of practical ways of engaging those skills and learning how to adapt to the college environment. So in, a, in addition to that, there's also many workshops, survival guides. Um, those are more group setting activities that we host. Survival guides are um, activities that we do with faculty collaboration um, so that students are really engaged throughout the class and with their faculty's involvement. So if they have a accounting test that's coming up. We engage with uh, accounting faculty many times 
to give students real relevant skills on how do you prepare, prepare for this class? How do you prepare for upcoming tests? And how do you be successful um, as new challenges arise? So it's a, another opportunity we give to more of a group setting. Everything that we do offer students one-on-one -on -one and in group, we also have online. So if students wanna just take a look at what we might offer, they can get an overview of that on our website. Um, there's self-guided activities and resources there that students can dabble in or maybe kind of get a sense of where they're at and then bring that resource in and speak with one of our staff members. And the last part I'd really like to hit on is our leadership opportunities. Um, all of these peer-led programs are Gonzaga students. Um, we have a staff of about 50 student employees that work as peer tutors, peer mentors, um, and it's a great opportunity for them to um, really demonstrate what they've learned as a student at Gonzaga and contribute back um, and to continue that process. Our peer tutors and coaches are great students, but even great students still have to try hard and still have to seek out help. Um, and so really just learning that skill to work with your peers, be a leader in the community, but also be vulnerable and be able to ask for help when you need it um, and demonstrate that skill. So that's what we do in the area of learning strategies. Colleagues, thank you so much for that just really wonderful description. Parents, I hope that um, you can see that by working together in the Center for Student Academic Success, we think that we can um, best support students to be the best, most active independent learners um, that they can be. Um, we'd like to think that we meet uh, students exactly where they are in their individual courses or holistically um, as a learner and help get them to the next level. Um, every student, regardless of how prepared or underprepared they feel, um, can benefit from tapping into the services and the resources that we provide in the Center for Student Academic Success. And students won't ever knock on the wrong door or, or call the wrong number um, in CSAS because wherever they land, wherever they enter the center, um, they'll be um, uh, taken care of and uh, um, shepherded to the best, uh, most specialized um, professional who can help them uh, get the resources and the, the and tap into the services that they need. So again, this is what we do best here in the Center for Student Academic Success is we really empower students. Um, I'd like to encourage you to be a good partner with us and uh, when your student is calling you at week four, week five, concerned about grades or uh, concerned about um, uh, whether or not they're they're learning deeply um, or if they're uh, meeting your expectations or their own expectations, I'd like to ask you to point them back toward our direction. Uh, remind them of the Center for Student Academic Success and the professionals um, who are um, here to really serve uh, your students. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you everyone from the Center for Student Academic Success. That was a very informative and descriptive presentation. I'm sure all of our parents appreciate it. While the Office of Health Promotion is pulling up their presentation and sharing their screen, I wanted to let everybody know that if you joined late, we are recording this uh, video and will be posted on our YouTube channel. And if you have any questions for the Center for Student academic success, go ahead and put them in the chat and we will get on to them later on in the Q&A session. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to the Office of Health Promotion. Wonderful. Hello, everyone. My name is Katie Noble and I use she, her, hers pronouns. I serve as one of the health educators in the Office of Health Promotion. Today, we're going to go through some brief introductions of our health education team, the role in the work of our office on campus, and our primary three content areas. We'll be sure to leave that time at the end of the training today or a conversation to ask any questions that you may have. So, in addition to our director, Jenna Parisi, who was unable to join us today, our team has three professional staff members that serve as health educators. I'll let my colleagues take just a few moments to introduce themselves, starting with Christina. Hi everyone, my name is Christina Thomas. I am the healthy educator 
for uh, healthy relationships and balance prevention. And I also serve as a lead investigator for the university. Um, just, I also use she, her, hers pronouns. Um, and there are some fun facts. And yes, I am the youngest of 15 kids. A lot of people get really shocked by that. And over to Sydney. So my name is Sydney Chaifet. I um, also use she, her pronouns. I am another health educator in the Office of Health Promotion. My focus area is alcohol and other drugs. Um, fun facts about me, before coming to GU, I was working on infectious disease prevention and control abroad. Awesome. Uh, so again, my name is Katie Noble and my work focuses on mental and emotional well-being and suicide prevention. As you can see, I'm a proud dog mom. Often in Zoom sessions, you'll see him passed out on the couch behind me. Uh, I'm an avid traveler. I've been to 17 different countries. And one of my favorite forms of self-care is actually baking. Uh, in my previous life or previous career, I guess, uh, I owned an at-home bakery uh, and I've baked more than 10,000 cupcakes in my lifetime. So now that you know a little bit more about us, let's move into talking about the role of the Office of Health Promotion here at Gonzaga. So our work focuses on helping others to understand the intersection of our three content areas, as well as addressing the work throughout the socio-ego, sorry, the socio-ecological model uh, that you see listed here in the upper right-hand corner of the screen. We provide opportunities to have conversations with students, staff, faculty, and the greater Gonzaga community about the different levels of influence and opportunities that contribute to the health and well-being of our students. As Zags, we're called by our university's mission to the development of the whole person or cura personalis through the eight dimensions of well-being. We believe that each student deserves the opportunities to learn and practice the strategies that will help them thrive here at Gonzaga and beyond. We advance our public health framework through data-driven approaches and collaboration with campus partners by leading initiatives, programs, and identifying services and spaces that reduce high-risk behaviors and promote positive and holistic well-being. A question that we often receive is that folks don't fully understand the difference between our work and that of the Center for Cura Personalis or Health and Counseling Services. The best way that I can describe that to you all is that uh, our work primarily focuses on preventative care and community-based education, while the Center for Cura Personalis and Health and Counseling Services is often responsive care, and it's one-on-one -on -one services for students who may need assistance. So now let's dive a little bit deeper into each of these three primary content areas to have a better understanding of why our work is so important for your Zags. And again, also in the healthy relationships and violence prevention area, we operate on a promote and prevent aspect along with our additional content areas. What we really try to do is promote what healthy communication and engagement can look like in a relationship and really pushing that not just in intimate partner relationships, but your relationship with your roommate, with your parents, um, with your supervisors, your classmates, and trying to delve deeper into that. As well as we want to bring consent awareness and practice, again, that does not just revolve around sexual or romantic endeavors, but also consent to give somebody a hug or to do those things and kind of getting into the use of practice and figuring out what that consent looks like. And finally, we really want to promote what education and respect looks like towards our fellow human beings and our fellow Zags and how they all tie in together to promote a healthy relationships and how that can help us prevent any violence, uh, especially in the realm of sexual and relationship violence or IPVs or roommates, and that falls into just physical, mental, and emotional harm. We want to prevent any misinformation around what a healthy relationship might look like and what one can do in terms of violence prevention. And we want to make sure our Zags are trained in what warning signs look like and how not to turn a blind eye and make sure that they feel empowered to step in to either rectify the situation or get themselves or their peers help if they need to do so. And one of the ways that we do that is through our Zags Help Zags program. Um, you and your Zags will hear that a lot throughout campus. It's a really big term of Zags Help Zags, open a door or do these things. We're a very giving community. Um, but what it really ties down to is bystander intervention. What we really try to do is empower individuals to promote well-being and to take action on how to prevent any physical, mental, or emotional harm. We do that by equipping our care strategies and it offers a list of ways that they can step in or ask for help or reach out to another that they can intervene if they see something that's happening, whether it be something as small as friendships kind of not going well, or something as big as seeing a friend or the peer or themselves in a situation that might be potentially dangerous for them. 
Hi all. So again, um, I'm Sydney. I focus on alcohol and other drugs. Um, so what are the things that I'm trying to promote in regards to alcohol and drug education on campus? And what are those things that I'm trying to prevent? Um, so in regards to promotion, reflection around substance use. Ideally, I would like students to be able to identify why is it that I choose to use this substance? Um, what are the um, good things about it? And what are the potential not so good things about it? Um, next, I want to promote harm reduction strategies. This is certainly something big that we push with students when they kind of come through um, the process of meeting with me. Um, what are the ways that I can reduce my risk of harm, um, not only for myself, but for those around me if I choose to engage in alcohol and other drugs. Uh, and lastly, in regards to promotion would be responsible and informed substance use. Um, knowing the ways that students can reduce their risk of harm, um, but also the ways in which alcohol and other drugs impact them, their bodies, um, their physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, all aspects of their health. Um, often we find that students um, come into the collegiate sphere with a, a limited knowledge of alcohol and other drugs. Um, and so ideally I, I um, would like them to have a better understanding of the ways in which it impacts themselves and others. Um, Shifting over to prevention. So I aim to prevent high risk substance use. Um, so an example of this would be binge drinking. Uh, binge drinking is essentially high risk drinking, drinking a lot of alcohol in a short period of time. Um, also, I aim to prevent unintended consequences. Um, so those things that that might follow alcohol and other drug use um, and how can we prevent those from occurring. Um, next would be use that interferes with goals and wellness. Um, so, you know, just as it says, use that, use that interferes with goals and wellness, um, helping students kind of prioritize um, and finding that balance we often hear students are seeking. Um, so overall, I take a public health preventative approach to alcohol and other drugs, um, but my role is also unique in that I take um, more of a reactive approach as well. So often people wanna know what, in what capacity might a student meet with me. Um, there's, there tends to be two. So the first would be small group classes. Um, we offer a course called Alcohol Skills Training Program. Uh, and this is really giving students those tips, tools, resources, um, basic knowledge of alcohol, how it impacts the body, um, and, and heavily focusing on those harm reduction techniques. Um, the other aspect in which students might meet with me is a one-on-one -on -one session. Um, so me and that student, um, we, you know, this might be basics, which is in response to an alcohol violation um, or impact, which is in response to a cannabis violation um, or any other drug violation on campus. Um, so shifting into the why a student might meet with me, um, three ways. So the first would be, um, you know, there's been some sort of a violation to the alcohol and other drug policy. And in that case, a student would go through the conduct process. And one of the outcomes of that process might be either taking the small group class or meeting with me individually. Um, next would certainly be students who opt in. And we have a handful of students every year who opt in to meet with me. Um, these are students who have identified that their relationship with alcohol or other drugs isn't what they would ideally like it to be. Um, and so really, they're, they're looking for a trusted supporter that can kind of help them grasp a better understanding of these substances and the ideal role that they would like it to play in their life. Um, I tell every student that I interact with that I am an ally to them on campus. I am a trusted supporter um, and I always want to meet with them and kind of um, work with them on the outcome that they would like to achieve. Um, next, lastly, would be referred students. Um, so we talked earlier about the refer form from the Center for Cure Personalis, and I work closely with the Center for Cure Personalis uh, to meet with students who, you know, a parent might have referred to them or a roommate or a friend or a professor or something like that. Um, so many people are curious about my approach to alcohol and other drug education or what our approach as office health promotion is. Um, so my approach is non-judgmental. Um, I meet students where they're at in whatever stage of change. Um, really, it's coming from an empowerment model. I always tell students, I'm not here to punish you. I'm not here to tell you what to do. You're an adult and you get to make your own decisions. Uh, and we also know that sustainable change comes from within. So really, I use a communication technique called motivational interviewing, um, which kind of aims to empower and help students identify what their commitments towards change are, um, what might get them to that ideal relationship, uh, what some of those barriers might be, that sort of thing. Um, the last thing I'll touch on is a campus resource, um, which is our collegiate recovery community. That is called Our House. 
Um, so we identify that there are students in our community that aim to, that are living a sober lifestyle or aim to, um, uh, are exploring sobriety of alcohol and other drugs. Um, so our house is a space for students to gather and build community and also um, get resources and support. Um, so while as its primary focus is students that are in recovery from a substance use disorder, in years past we've also served students that are in recovery from other process addictions. Um, so this is a resource that I want you all as parents to be aware of. Um, it is a resource to your student, as well as meeting with me individually. Thank you so much. All right, and then finally for my content area, our work focuses on prevent, oh, I'm sorry, on promoting the eight dimensions of well-being, including conversations around finding balance, self-care and self-compassion, stress management, and the importance of good sleep. We also work to understand health beyond a physical health standpoint, to really expand what the definition of mental health is, and to help folks understand that mental health is not synonymous with mental illness. Mental health is truly a state of well-being in which an individual can realize their own abilities, how they cope with the normal stresses of life, how they can work productively and fruitfully, and how they're able to contribute to our community. Our trainings help Zags to develop the necessary skill sets to be able to help address the challenges as they arise in college, whether it be for them individually or for a fellow member of our Gonzaga community. In this area, our trainings include workshops about suicide prevention and mental health first aid, which more than 2.5 million Americans have trained in, and it's a program that's being taught in more than 25 different countries across the globe. Our work also promotes resiliency. That's our ability to overcome adversity or challenge, and it also promotes building connection. The research shows that building connection can empower students to thrive while also lowering signs and symptoms of anxiety and depression. It helps us to better regulate our emotions. It leads to higher self-esteem and empathy, and it actually improves our immune system. When we neglect our need to connect with others, we put our own health at risk, as well as the health of our community. The reality is, is that we're living in a time where true disconnection is taking place, which has unfortunately gotten worse during COVID. So providing these opportunities for our students to connect in a healthy way and in a way to reduce risk is really pivotal right now. Our work is done to pre prevent the adverse impacts that students may experience while in college, uh, maybe the worsening or the development of a mental illness, and to really prevent students from experiencing suicidal thoughts or actions or what's called non-suicidal self-harm. Our work collectively helps students to proactively reflect and improve their own holistic well-being. Finally, one of our programs that you may become familiar with at Gonzaga is our Zag into Action course, which is required for incoming students. This collaboration with several departments across campus includes information about the three content areas that we've discussed today, as well as the Zags Help Zags program. And in addition, we talk about topics like Title IX, diversity, equity, and inclusion, the first year experience, and university and community resources that are available for students. Your ZAG will receive more information about this program and the deadline to complete it via their Gonzaga email account. So make sure that they're checking that. Um, finally, just wanna thank you all uh, for having this conversation with us. Please stay in touch with us. You can check out our website at gonzaga.edu slash OHP or you can email us with any concerns or questions that you might have following this training. Uh, you can also follow us on social media or encourage your Zag to. Uh, this is where we'll share tips and information about well-being and other resources that are available on campus. And this is gonna be a really vital tool for us for the upcoming year uh, in continuing these conversations with students. So we are happy to have this conversation with you all and we are ready to take any questions that you may have about our work or otherwise. Okie dokie, thank you everybody from the Office of Health Promotion. We're gonna go ahead and move into the Q&A section. Um, 
There are some questions in here for the Center for Student Academic Success. While I'm going through those, if anybody has questions for the Office of Health Promotion, go ahead and put them in the chat and we'll get to them. Additionally, if we do not make it to any of your questions today due to time constraints, the Office of Health Promotion and the Center for Student Academic Success will have either pre-recorded or live sessions at our parent and family orientation website. If you are signed up for that, through that you will be able to submit questions to them as well. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Um, we had a private question sent over to me. How many advisors are on staff or how many students are there per advisor? I'm assuming this has to do with academic advising and assistance. I, I can take that. Um, so Gonzaga is primarily a faculty advisor model, meaning students who are assigned to a faculty member within their college or school. There are a very small percentage of students who have professional advisors. Most of those are for either their freshman or their sophomore years. Those are students in the School of Business and then students in the School of Engineering and the nursing program. Um, students who are assigned to us for primary advising Right now, we have advising loads between 70 and 100 students, but we don't have teaching loads on top of that. If a student's paired with a faculty member, faculty have anywhere between one and 25 um, advisees at a time. And then the professional advisors in the bigger schools, like Jane Hessian for School of Business, she has 300 um, to 400 advisees at a time. And um, in the School of Nursing, Marcy carries a load less than 200 advisees, but that is their full-time job. They don't do other things outside of advising. Following up with that question, how can a student find out who their academic advisor is? For incoming freshmen, that information is distributed right before orientation. So sometime in August, they'll get an email from us. Awesome. Thank you. We do have some people that are asking about COVID-19 updates. I wanted to let everybody know that a communication will be coming out from President Thane McCullough uh, this Friday, July 24th concerning a reopening plan. In addition to that, a comprehensive reopening plan will be going out to all parents, families, and students either at the end of July or the beginning of August. Um, I hope that can answer some of your COVID-19 questions right now. We don't really have any firm answers about a COVID-19 update. Sorry about that. Moving back to the Q&A. Clarify the advisor roles. There are academic advisors and student life advisors. So just maybe if there are student life advisors, or I guess that has to do with no. No student life advisors, just academic advisors. Okay, another private question. Where can uh, someone find paperwork or a form about the medical documentation for accommodations? Excuse me. So if, um, he, uh, if uh, someone wants to find information, they can go to our website, uh, www.gonzaga.edu slash disability access and click on the student resources section. I'll, I'll, I'll link that in the, the chat. Um, and uh, we have all of our documentation guidelines there, guidance there, I should say, um, and, uh, um, and, and uh, instructions on how to apply for accommodations. Um, so I'll, I'll link that in the, uh, in the chat. Awesome. Okay. One question for everybody. Uh, there's a lot of information about success for the students. However, my daughter and I want to ensure that she is bringing the right school supplies to college to be successful besides a computer. Is there a recommendation of other supplies that the students need to bring to school? Examples, composition books, graph paper, any recommendations? Um, don't know if anybody on our panel wants to talk to that, but I am a rising junior at Gonzaga right now. And I would say that having your computer um, 
about five notebooks depending on their class load and then calculators are helpful and then depending on major graph paper definitely is a must okay um, i'm gonna go ahead and move forward with the questions for a student who has a 504 plan and can use electronic means to take notes example ipad is there wi-fi in the classrooms to download a lecture or slideshow yeah, so um, definitely uh, Wi-Fi coverage uh, campus-wide. Um, we do, I, I do recommend that uh, if, if, they're, if they need that due to their condition, which it sounds like they do, um, that they go through our office and we make that an accommodation to allow them to use their electronic device. Um, just some faculty uh, um, don't want students using electronic devices in the classroom unless they need it for accommodation. And so, um, uh, most students don't have trouble with it, but it can occasionally arise. And so it, um, we, we do put that in our accommodation plan if that's something the student needs. Next question. Do student athletes primarily work with their advisor in the athletics department or their advisor for their major? Athletes should be working with an advisor for their major for their course planning. Um, athletics will help the student build the schedule around their practice times, but for the, the in-depth advising, the student should be working with their faculty member. So again, the Office of Health Promotion is available to answer questions. So if you have any questions about preventative care here on campus, go ahead and put them in the chat below. Um, moving on to the next question, should a student bring a printer? Um, there is printing access here at Gonzaga. There's a printer in Hemmingson. There's a printer in Foley. There's a printer in Coughlin Hall. And then there's some other printers spread throughout some other buildings on campus. Uh, your student just needs Bulldog Box and their Zag card to be able to access those printers and print. Um, I know there is an online tutorial on how to print um, on Foley Library's website. I'm not entirely sure where that is though. I'm gonna jump in here really quick and answer a question quite a ways up from Rose um, about, you know, is, is meeting with me or alcohol and other drugs sort of information uh, purely reactive? That's a great question. Um, and no, certainly. Last year I met with a handful of students who, um, many of them were first year students or had had an experience with alcohol and other drugs that really um, made them want to seek more information and more knowledge. Um, so certainly I meet with students one-on-one -on -one to kind of have a conversation um, or that alcohol skills training program is um, a two-parted class. It's one hour, you know, two Fridays in a row, one hour. Um, and it kind of gives them all of that basic information around alcohol. Um, but certainly I would encourage you to um, reach out to us at OHP at gonzaga.edu um, and we'll get you aligned with me and I'll, I'll help you connect with all those resources. But certainly I, I love meeting with students um, as a kind of a preactive approach. Sorry for missing that question. Thank you for jumping in, Sydney. Okay, question on here. How do students find a work study job? Uh, we actually did a Zag Talk 101 with uh, student finances. That was our first Zag Talk. That video can be found on our YouTube page. They talked about how you can find a work study job if you want to go ahead and check that out. Um, next question. I heard that the Wi-Fi is too slow in some areas in the campus, but there are Ethernet ports that can connect to the campus network and the internet. What's the recommended ethernet cable and length? Um, that would probably be a question for our IT department. I know most students don't carry ethernet cables in their bag, um, but I wanna say like, I, uh, I would not know what the standard ethernet cable is, but you can contact our IT department if you have any questions about that. Um, I can offer some insight to that. Prior to stepping into this role, I was also a resident instructor at Gonzaga living in the halls. And so well, there is no standard Ethernet port um, or anything like that, but probably just keep in mind that some of the furniture may or may not be movable. So unless they plan on extending their cords all over the place, um, probably no more than five feet would be okay. Otherwise, you're just going to have a large coil set of wires. 
Um, and sometimes the Wi-Fi is slow because sometimes there's about 4,000 people using it all at once. And it's just kind of dependent, but for the most part, it's pretty significant um, that you can get things done. And it's not too slow that you can't complete work at all. So majority of the time, you don't need an Ethernet port, but sometimes if they're struggling within the residence hall in their specific room, they can go into any of the common areas or to Hemmingson or to any of those areas to get work done. And the routers are a lot more frequent there, so they can connect a little bit faster. Next question, does Gonzaga provide software applications such as Adobe, Microsoft Office, et cetera, for free or a student discount? Um, so concerning Microsoft Office, with their Zagmail, they do have access to the Microsoft Office 365 suite. Um, I am unsure about Adobe, though. Um, uh, if I could offer something there. Um, I, I heard that they were uh, getting Adobe for all s uh, student staff and faculty once COVID hit. So um, I, it'd definitely be an IT question, but um, I do believe that uh, we, have a, we have an enterprise account that you can sign in with your, um, your Zag ID. Sorry, your, your username an email. Great. Thank you, Jason. Um, that's all that we have in the chat now. If you guys have more questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, we will stick around for a couple of minutes to answer those. I did want to read out some comments by our Office of Health Promotion team. Uh, before we move on to the questions, I wanted to make sure that everybody that may not have access to the chat can see those. Um, Katie said that self-care is an important part of being successful on campus. Encourage your Zag to think about how they will proactively engage in self-care as they balance their well-being. And Christina also put, I would also recommend bringing other items that are non-academic to contribute to their overall success. Pictures from home, favorite articles of clothing, favorite books, etc. The residence halls will become let's see, it moved up, will become their new home, bring items that make them feel like it's a place of rest. Smiley face, awesome. Okay, dokie. Next question, we have a private question to us. Regarding what to bring to campus, we recently received in the mail from Parent Family Relations a detailed what to bring checklist that was very detailed and extremely helpful. So if anybody did not receive that mailer, if you are a first year family, go ahead and email us at families at gonzaga.edu and we can get you a virtual copy of that checklist. Um, moving on to the next question. Should a student buy a laptop at home considering COVID? Can they use their student discount at home or have to wait until they get to Gonzaga? Yikes. Okay, I am unsure at this time whether or not uh, Foley Library will be open for students to use the computers that are in there. If anybody does know, feel free to hop on, I'm assuming this will come out in the comprehensive reopening plan that the president is sending out, but I do recommend that a student buy their own computer. And I am also unsure of a student discount. Um, and, and since we have a IT work study in here, um, he can maybe correct me, but I, um, I do know that if a student can't afford a laptop, IT has been, um, they keep their old ones and they, they, they can pr provide them to students that need them. Um, just that out there. Okay, and Jason also put the IT helpline in the chat um, for those that may have trouble accessing their Zeg mail. Um, awesome. During the first year experience orientation program, do you address issues of stress, homesickness, time management, etc.? So this would be the new student orientation program. Hi. Yeah, um, I believe FYE will be addressing all of those areas. Your orientation leaders will be fully trained in how to take care of this. They're going to meet with different aspects of campus. And it, they, your SAGs won't only be alone with the orientation leaders. They will have wonderful resident assistants that will also be in their halls that go through a very extensive training to touch base and reach out to them, um, especially RAs who have first year students. They are very in tune. They start off right off the bat with meeting with their students and kind of getting them connected and building a little bit community. And eventually throughout the year, they'll also talk, do one-on-ones with them to kind of check in on where they're doing regarding their stress, homesickness, and kind of managing their time as well. 
or zag into action course also uh, when we're talking about mental and emotional well-being does incorporate some conversations around um, you know, just recognizing when someone might be struggling um, and how that can contribute to our mental health as well. And to follow up with all that, um, I got an individual message about if there's a system in place where all students are checked in on, a student might not come to us if they're experiencing anxiety, but might need um, some assistance there. Um, so I'll, I'll welcome Katie and Christina to touch on this as well. Um, so two things. One, um, the Center for Cure Personalis is CCP is reaching out to students um, if they kind of get a referral to do so. Like I said, oftentimes parents will reach out to CCP or professors or friends or roommates of students. Um, you know, to kind of let them know, hey, this student might be more. I'm concerned because of this. Um, and then CCP reaches out and says, hey, you know, I, you want to meet? That sort of thing. Um, and then the second thing, I think our bystander intervention program, Zags Help Zags, really encourages the entire campus community uh, to check in on each other, um, kind of promote those resources, that sort of thing. Yeah, I will add to that as well. One of the things that um, CCP does as they connect with health and counseling services is that every incoming student is asked to fill out uh, a form in terms of where they are at for their mental health and their physical health. And that allows us to get information in terms of um, just basically where's a student at coming in because what we know to be true um, about mental health is that uh, students who have experienced things like de depression or anxiety um, at an earlier age and we know the onset of that is typically in the early uh, teenage years uh, is that uh, when we're able to compile that information we're just able to provide more resources and more opportunities for students and we know that students that are really honest on that form they have multiple points of connection with folks across campus that can provide additional support should a student get to the point of where they're struggling and again from the work in our office we really focus on that preventative lens of what's the skill set coming into college that we can help you develop to navigate some of those challenges that you may experience Awesome. It looks like Jason added a link to the referral website, www.gonzaga.edu slash refer. This form can be filled out by anybody that's concerned about a student. So if at any time during the school year you feel concerned about your ZAG, you can go ahead and fill out that form. Um, I believe that we've addressed all of the questions that are currently in the chat. We just had one sent privately to us. Um, Sorry. Um, go ahead. And, well, uh, there was a question up way up above about uh, how work study students can get a job. I just wanted to point out, I'm going to put a link to the student employment office there. That's a uh, place they can go. Sorry to interrupt. No, thank you, Jason. Um, so a question sent privately to us. If my student is planning to attend Gonzaga through the online program due to COVID-19, how can he, she feel welcome or supported miles away? Um, I'll just put out there, a lot of offices have uh, virtual office hours. Um, and so definitely be looking for those. Um, my office does, we hold them every day. If a student needs to drop in with questions, we're happy to talk to them face to face. Um, all offices are being set up for, um, all offices are set up for virtual uh, meetings uh, and something that we're, I think most of us are uh, kind of endorsing rather than um, people coming into the office necessarily. Um, uh, just to keep that social distancing, that safety. And so those students can access all of us uh, remotely in that way as well. But uh, I know that that's a, a reach out from the students, but that's um, what I have to offer right now. Um. I, I know the orientation program is also coming up with ways for students who are going to be virtual this coming fall semester who want to take their courses online. They'll have options for students to take their orientation sessions virtually through Zoom. Um, so look for more information about that coming in August. Students will have to actually sign up for all the sessions that they want to attend. So that should be coming soon. 
And then from a faculty standpoint, I know there's a lot of work being done related to some of the uh, what's called andragogical approaches or the way that people learn. So making sure that there's connection for folks that are taking online classes of how they can interact in virtual settings with their uh, fellow classmates and those types of things. Yeah, Katie, good point. Um, just to dovetail on what she said, um, uh, the uh, Center for Teaching and Advising um, and, and the uh, uh, academic task force are putting a lot of effort into ensuring that those students that are not um, present in the classroom still get the Cadillac uh, educational experience that uh, we expect at Gonzaga. Awesome. That looks like the last question that we had in the chat. Um, we will be hanging around until about one if you have any additional questions. Um, when is the next webinar? That was a question that was sent to us privately. The next webinar will be next Wednesday at noon. Once again, we will be meeting with the, we will be meeting with DICE, um, Student Involvement and Leadership, and then Center for Community Engagement. So we'll have three offices on that webinar next Wednesday at noon. And we, again, we're gonna be hanging around until one if you have any additional questions.
All right, I'm gonna go ahead and end the webinar. I wanna thank my co-hosts for being on here with me. You did an amazing job with your presentations and answering all of the questions that were thrown your way. But um, I'm gonna go ahead and end the webinar. Thank you so much. Thanks everybody. Thank Take you, care. see ya. Thanks.